Okay, let us start. So my name is Nikolai Prokofiev from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So let's continue our session on topology and strong correlations. Uh, the first talk will be given by Emmanuel Gould from the University of Michigan, and he will tell us about diagrammatic Monte Carlo for real space propagation. Okay, thank you. Um, right, so this talk tries to give an overview of diagrammatic Monte Carlo methods and continuous time Monte Carlo methods. Uh, essentially just to show you what these methods are, what they can do, and what the general uh, outlook is. And then I'll show I'll in, in a little bit more detail three basic algorithmic improvements, bold line methods, causal methods, or so-called inchworm methods, and then embedding methods that are based on this. And finally, I'll show you how we're trying to use numerical methods to extract as much physics as possible out of these simulations to really then uh, say something about physical um, systems. Now, before I go there, I'm gonna have to briefly tell you a little bit about diagrams. And I'm gonna go all the way back here and start from a very simple Hamiltonian, for example, this electronic structured Hamiltonian. Um, typically, I'll take a Hamiltonian, I'll put it onto a finite size lattice or into a uh, quantum chemistry basis. And the task that we're interested in is to find energies, single particle spectral functions, two particle susceptibilities, or anything like that for a system here in a grand canonical ensemble at some temperature and some chemical potential. Now, uh, back in uh, early graduate school, you were taught how to do that. Essentially, you take your Hamiltonian and you split it into two parts, one part that you like and one part that you don't. And then you write down the grand partition function uh, in an interaction representation of the part that you don't like with respect to the part, uh, to the part that you like. You expand this exponential that you have up here into a time-ordered uh, exponential series, and you end up with a uh, infinite series here that goes over an infinite number of terms, H2, that's your perturbation term over here, of, well, integrals between zero and beta, of something that actually looks fairly complicated. Now, for each term that we have here, there's an integral over an, int an imaginary time uh, integral, and then there, you know, if you have in H2 additional sums, there will be additional sums over terms. Now, expressions like that look fairly complicated, um, but really people have worked with these expressions since the middle of the 1950s. Uh, the first step that you do is you go and you abbreviate uh, the individual terms in a diagrammatic language by drawing pictures rather than drawing these expressions that I had on the previous slide. But really, whenever you see a diagram, you should think of a series similar to this one, and then you start typically by approximating this series, right? Um, you pick the terms that you like out of physical grounds, uh, and you sum those up uh, either at a low order uh, series, if H2 is much uh, smaller than H1, or you choose a certain class of diagrams, typically out of necessity rather than out of physically, physical insight, uh, that then sum up uh, to infinite order. And there are very many methods that work like this. The random phase approximation is one of those. GW is a different name for that approximation. There's a so-called non-crossing approximation, the one-crossing approximation. You can go to go uh, to fluctuation exchange or flex. You can do ladders, you can do parquet, and so on. Right? All of these are methods that sum up certain diagrams in, in such a series. Now, typically, when you work like that, it is very difficult to ascertain that the results are meaningful outside of the weak coupling limit, right? If H2 is not much, much smaller than H1, it's typically uncontrolled, and you have to argue based on physical intuition why your solution is still meaningful. Now, as I mentioned, this is really 1950s physics. So what is new? Well, let's go back to that series. Let's get back to that series and realize that that series is just a very high dimensional series, an infinite, uh, with an infinite number of term here, of very, very high order integrals. But we know how to do high order integrals, right? We can use Monte Carlo methods to sum up these individual terms in the series and sample uh, all of these different diagrams or all of these different terms that occur in this series. Um, by sampling different topologies, different internal indices, and different time locations, you can then recover the value of that partition function or measure observable with the weight that they contribute to this partition function. Right? Each diagram, or each term that I showed in this expansion here, has a weight. We randomly take a diagrams, we, we change 
uh, it by inserting or removing vertices, by shuffling around line, by rearranging internal indices, and so on. And we can use a Monte Carlo important sampling procedure to walk through diagram space and in this way randomly sample up all of these, uh, all of these terms in that series above. Right? And with that, once we're doing that, we can construct estimators for, say, a density, a Green's function, or a susceptibility, and measure expectation values of those observables. So the general idea, as I said, is you start by identifying a convergent diagrammatic expansion. You realize that it's just a very high order integral. You then def define a Monte Carlo important sampling procedure for diagrams. Essentially, you make sure that you sa satisfy ergodicity and detail balance. And you sample all of the diagrams stochastically. The advantages are that as long as all of these diagrams are sampled, the only error that you have is a stochastic sampling error. These procedures are numerically exact and they're controlled. The stochastic sampling errors converge like one over the square root of the number of samples. So if you're not sure if your result is right or accurate enough within the error bars that you have, you just keep sampling for longer and obtain smaller error bars. And with that, you have a rigorous control over uncertainties. There's a perceived limitation here. Um, well, first of all, there are very many diagrams and really an infinite dimensional space. Now, fortunately, the dimensionality of the integral does not enter your Monte Carlo estimates, right? But there's an actual limitation, namely, if as you interpret the, time, the terms in your expansion, those Taylor series expansion terms as weights of a stochastic sampling, you really need to have a probabilistic interpretation of this, and that means they have to be positive. If you just go and you do a Taylor series, nobody guarantees you that all of the terms are positive. So typically, um, you run in what is called, into what is called a sign problem. You have some terms that are positive, some terms uh, that are negative, and your signal disappears in the noise. So a lot of effort is actually spent in a, uh, reformulating series in such a way that they have mostly positive or positive expansions. Now, let me show here early success that we had in simulating these methods for uh, fermions. What you see over here is the typical numerical problem size that we had in these methods as a function of inverse temperature here. This is a single site dynamical mean field calculation at a, a U of about the bandwidth. Details here are not that important. What you see is that back in 1986, the state of the art algorithm, which at the time was based on a Trotter Suzuki decomposition, um, scale something like this over here. Uh, back in 2005, with an interaction expansion, we were down to a scaling like this. And then in 2006, with the current method of choice, we're down to a scaling that is somewhere here. You see that all of these are linear in beta, but there is a prefactor of about 30 or so between the 1986 method and our current state-of-the-art method. And that means that because these are matrix uh, operations that we have here, they go with the matrix size cubed, the linear size cubed, uh, it corresponds to a speed up of about 30 cubed or 27,000 or if you think in Moore's law, it's about you know, 25 years of Moore's law in just time to solution that we have with these diagrammatic expansions as compared to simple Trotter-Suzuki based uh, methods. Another advantage that we have is shown over here. This is an imaginary part of a self-energy uh, as a function of frequency. You can see that if you use this method over here, you'll get something that has a systematic delta tau error. This is plotted over here. The delta, delta tau error is controlled, so you just make your delta tau, your discretization a little bit smaller, you'll get a different result. In this case, if you make it twice as small, you get the red curve over here. As you keep doing that, you get the green curve, and then using those three points, you can extrapolate to the exact result, which in this case, we know from a different method, namely exact diagonalization down here. In what I have shown you, by sampling these integral, integrals, there is no delta tau, there's no concept of this discretization, and as you sample these uh, series stochastically, you of course uh, end up directly on the right result. And with that, you have an elimination of uh, uh, systematic errors in your problem. So we can do the same thing 25,000 times faster, and we can do the same thing much more accurately as previously. But really, what gets us going in this field is that with basing or by basing our methods on diagrammatic series and on the theory of Feynman diagrams, we can become much more general and we can look at much more sort of interesting or general problems. So previously we were doing single orbital problems. Now we have 
large multi-orbital problems. We were looking at Hubbard interactions. Nowadays, we do quantum chemistry using the full fermion, four fermion interaction terms. Large system that used to mean two by two clusters. We're now doing hundreds of cluster sites. We can look at effective problems like condo problems. We can take a system and blast it with a laser and look at its time dependent response. We can look at vertex functions and MIRD's vertex functions, two particle probes, photons and screening, and for example, uh, superconductivity, and a little bit more about that um, later. So let me show you a sort of basic example of how these methods work in practice. What you see here is an example that comes from cold atomic gas physics that tells you how we would typically do a simulation. Here you see a cluster of 18 sites that we use for uh, solving a problem. Uh, in this case, we're interested in thermodynamics, so energies, densities, entropies, free energies, all of that stuff, and we'll simply computed in an approximate formulation on a small lattice. We then repeat the calculation on a slightly larger lattice, in this case 36 sites. We do 48, 56, 64, 84, all the way up to 100 sites. We know analytically the finite size scaling of these quantities, so what we do is we take the approximate results, put them onto a plot, supplement them here with the analytically known scaling, and once we know that they're on the thermodynamic limit curve, right, we obtain a result in the thermodynamic limit with a result in an error bar that now gives us the exact result of that infinite lattice model in the thermodynamic limit. And we can take this and go back to our experimental colleagues. Here you see an example again from cold atomic gas simulations coming from very, very high temperature where we have high temperature series expansion here. You see the numerical results or the theoretical results here of a spin correlation function that is a spin correlation function that shows a fairly large temperature response. That's why we're plotting it here. Um, as we lower the temperature, or in this case, the entropy. And if we supplement this by experiment, you can see that as we're starting out in the high temperature regime, these experiments are fairly accurate. They stay on the theoretical curve for some time. Uh, at this point, there is a breakdown. The experiment goes down, we go up. And we think we understand that this actually has to do with heating effects in the experiments. So that gives us more or less an indication of where cold atomic gas experiments can go. And the first interesting correlation physics, so the onset of antiferromagnetic long range order in this model is about still about a factor of two or so lower uh, in temperature. Now, comparing to experiments is always interesting. Another type of uh, comparison that we like to do is take methods that are biased in some way or potentially biased in some way and compare them against other methods that are biased in a completely different way. Here, for example, you see results for the Hubbard model uh, from on the order of 10 or so different algorithms where you see energies, in this case, coming from high temperature lowering the temperature, lowering the temperature even more, and then you see these results smoothly connecting to ground state results that come from methods like uh, auxiliary field QMC or uh, DMRG or fixed node Monte Carlo or, and things like that. And by putting uh, results from methods that are completely differently biased onto the same plot and comparing the results, we can learn how accurate these methods are in practice and you know which results uh, work in which regime and where they might potentially break down. This is interesting because uh, often you hear that we don't understand the Hubbard model. Um, what we actually find by comparing here the energies over a wide area of phase space is that the typical, if you convert this to cooperate units, the typical experimental systems or uncertainty of about 0.002 T uh, corresponds to an energy uncertainty of about five Kelvin, where the big physical effects if you think of Kuprets, happen at about 100 Kelvin. So this now gives us confidence that we can really use these methods to say something about you know, a correlated Harvard model at finite temperature in an interesting non-perturbative regime. Now, um, diagrammatics very, is very interesting, and in particular, you can use the toolbox that the 1950s physicists have developed for us uh, and then through the 1960s and 70s, and you can try to adapt that analytical toolbox to numerical methods. Now, a lot of this work has actually done by Nikolai, who's sitting right over here. Um, for example, you can take all of the diagrams that are sampled if you do a partition function expansion. You can take a logarithm, uh, then you're limiting yourself to the connected diagrams. You can make it self-consistent, meaning that you throw out the uh, uh, diagrams that are not skeleton diagrams, you can 
limit yourself to skeleton diagrams, and if you want to, you can go even farther and limit yourself to certain types of vertex functions. As you go down this route, right, the number of diagrams decreases, actually quite rapidly. The sign problem decreases, and the physical insight is in many ways much easier to gain from these systems. At the same time, you're paying for this. Your algorithmic complexity as you go from here to here to here increases vastly, rather than just taking a determinant of all of these diagrams, you actually have to enumerate them and filter out the ones that are connected or the ones that are irreducible or uh, skeleton or, or so. Um, as you then go uh, farther down this route, you see that also mathematical subtleties in particular problems with self-consistency and convergence uh, or ergodicity in Monte Carlo methods start to play a role and, and uh, things may become uh, tricky. Nevertheless, I'd like to show you a couple of sort of standard improvements that one can do with these uh, methods. Um, for example, if we do these simulations in real time and we look at the time-dependent evolution, for example, of a single electron transistor here, we can say that a propagator that starts at time t and goes to time t prime is more or less the atomic state propagator. Well, plus, in a weak coupling regime, we're gonna get one excursion. In this case, this is a self-energy insertion that you see over here. And then, of course, we're gonna to have to sample all possible diagrams, and pretty soon those diagrams get complicated, and we're gonna to have to enumerate just all of them. Now, this is naive, but you can imagine that you could take this as a starting point and go find your analytic friends and do the best that they can do. For example, we can say that the semi-bold propagator, which looks almost the same as this one, is the bare propagator, plus the bare propagator and such a self-energy occursion, plus the bare propagator and all of these rainbow uh, insertions, and that leads you to the so-called non-crossing approximation. These are coupled integral equations. Solving them takes uh, maybe three seconds on a computer. These are very efficient integral equations that we can do very, very quickly. Now, if we say that we want to have the exact propagator, then why not start from the approximate propagator that already has an infinite number of diagrams in them, supplement it with all of the diagrams that we haven't considered, for, for example, in this case, all of the crossing diagrams, that would be this, this, and then all of the higher order crossings diagrams. If we do that, we recover the exact result. There are many fewer diagrams because we've already absorbed most of the diagrams with short time excursion in this uh, so-called non-crossing approximation. The non-crossing approximation already knows about some variant of the condo effect, right? And if it is accurate, we only need to correct it by a tiny bit of, well, those crossing diagrams here that uh, matter. Now, does it actually work in practice? Well, here you see the average sign as a function of real time. And you can see that if we do it naively, just straightforwardly sampling all of the diagrams, then boom, your sign problem, uh, your average sign drops exponentially as a function of real time, and pretty much you're dead in the water. If we formulate this around one of those crossing approximations, in this case, the one crossing approximation, you can see that for the same sign budget here, we come about twice as far in real time or if we take this method and now sample the third order of crossing diagrams, the fourth order, the fifth order, the sixth order, uh, subsequently, you can see that we then gradually plateau. And if we can show that within those orders we're converging to the right result or to a, a self-consistent result, right, then we can uh, truncate this uh, at a fixed uh, sign. So this is extremely powerful. And it turns out that we can actually do much better. In these methods, there's causality. The propagator up to some time is pretty much the propagator up to some earlier time plus a, let's say, a bare propagator over here, a bare propagator and a self-energy insertion, maybe one that looks like this, maybe one that looks like that, or all sorts of higher order, more complicated diagrams. And you can imagine now a diagrammatic Monte Carlo procedure that takes the exact result that we have to some time and supplements it with a diagrammatic sampling here of all of these additional diagrams that gradually uh, goes to longer and longer time. So in practice, this is, this is real time on the Keldish contour. I'll, I'll show you results in just a bit. Right? In practice, the way we do this is like this, like an inchworm. We start on a small contour, then we simulate to slightly longer. We use that result to simulate to slightly longer, simulate to slightly longer, simulate to slightly longer, and propagate on the Keldish contour like an inchworm uh, like that. 
here's a result. What you see here is, again, a time-dependent problem uh, as a function of real time. These are populations. These are the errors on the populations. And you can see that with the naive methods, we get to a time of about, well, two or so in this unit, one and a half or so. Um, too short to say something about steady state. But as we switch from just bare diagrammatic Monte Carlo to so-called inchworm Monte Carlo, the method that I just show you, you can see that we can go to longer and longer times. The times that we can reach are given by the error that you see down here, and you can see that our error as a function of time increases a little bit, but certainly does not increase exponentially. Now this exponential error that we had uh, in the bear method, that is a sign problem, right? As you make your system larger in some parameter, uh, the effort of getting to larger times uh, grows exponentially. Here you can see that this is actually not the case anymore, right? We have in this way solved the real time or the dynamical sign problem that is very different from the fermionic sign problem, but it tells you that at polynomial effort, we can now uh, reach pretty much uh, as long times as we want. Now that allows us to do a lot of interesting physics. For example, what you see here is a real time Green's function as a function of time here uh, in a so-called dynamical mean field calculation starting from an initial solution which is very far from the converged solution. Then you can see by iteration two, we're a little bit closer, we're actually accurate up to here. Iteration three gets you up to here and then iterations four and five are on top of these earlier uh, iterations. Knowing the real-time Green's functions allows us to get spectral functions, and in particular, to put error bars onto these spectral functions. Here you see a so-called voltage splitting of the condo peak, now obtained with, uh, from, from currents or from real-time Green's functions. Uh, what you see here is that we have error bars on these values. Error bars on the spectral functions now really allow you to make definite statements about excitations rather than having to rely on analytical continuation methods like the maximum entropy method that for these high temperatures and you know, non-equilibrium systems are really, really uh, unreliable. So a third type of uh, algorithmic method that allows us to use diagrammatics in a smart way to say something uh, about correlated systems are embedding methods. And to explain this or to motivate this, I want to go back to the 1960s to Luttinger and Ward. They told you that you should take a lattice Hamiltonian, and if you want to express its thermodynamic properties, in particular its grand potential, then that's essentially given by the Green's function, the self energy, and something which we call phi here, the so called Luttinger Ward functional, which consists of all linked closed skeleton diagrams with vertices V, these over here. Oh, this just gave out. The vertices V and uh, the, uh, the propagators or Green's functions G. Once you know phi, then the derivative of phi with respect to G gives you the self energy. Uh, the self energy gives you the Green's function. Out of the Green's function, you can reconstruct the self, uh, the Luttinger Ward functional self consistently. And that gives you a smart way of uh, approximating diagrammatics because, as Byman Kadanov told you uh, back in 1962 or so, if you make approximations to that lot in your word functional, rather than say to the Green's function or the self energy, you can guarantee a couple of important consolidation laws that, for example, make sure that you're not losing particles as you time evolve uh, your system. Now, there's a very simple embedding method or a first simple embedding method, the dynamical mean, mean field theory. Right? Dynamical mean field theory is an approximation to that Lottinger Ward functional where you take the exact Lottinger Ward functional and you kick out all of the terms that don't have the same uh, vertices. Hmm. Yeah, that don't have the same vertex, vertex index everywhere at every single vertex or the same orbital uh, index at, at all of these places. As you have only GII in here, when you take the derivative with respect to G, your self energy only is sigma II, and with that, your self energy is purely local to uh, your orbital. Now, this is a great method whenever the physics or the, the non perturbative physics, or I should say the correlation physics here, is purely uh, local to an orbital. Um, there are other methods. For example, low order approximations like the Hartree Fock method, the second order self consistent uh, Green's function uh, method, or the so called GW or RPA method, that take a certain subset of these diagrams, like these low order diagrams or this RPA series here, and some sum up these uh, diagrams non perturbatively. 
Now, because dynamical mean field theory and those methods are written in the same diagrammatic language, it's actually straightforward to take them and supplement a hartley fokker GF2 or a GW solution with a DMFT GF2 plus DMFT or GW DMFT uh, calculation. So this is now uh, perturbative in the non-local correlations, non-perturbative in the local correlation, um, and it's not able to capture non-perturbative, non-local correlation, and in a way, it's still uncontrolled because there's no small parameter that will allow you to make this systematically more and more accurate. Um, but you can take this formalism and you can gradually make it more and more systematic. Uh, this leads you to the so-called self-energy embedding theory, where you take the entire system, you solve it approximately in something like a second order perturbation theory or self-consistent GW calculation. You then don't just take the local orbitals, but you find the orbitals that are most strongly correlated, for example, those near the Fermi energy, those with an occupation much different from zero or two, or if you wanna do local orbitals, uh, those that are local, and then you treat those diagrams at a higher level. Um, so the diagrams in a subset of orbitals corresponds to a quantum impurity model. Using those diagrammatic Monte Carlo methods, you can solve these quantum impurity models non-perturbatively, and you can then insert or embed the solution of that impurity model self-consistently into a weak coupling uh, simulation. As you make that impurity subspace larger and larger and larger, you have a small parameter, namely the number of orbitals that you take, or one over the numbers of orbitals that you take, and you can uh, obtain self-energies and propagators via the Dyson equation, iterate and obtain a result. That sounds nice in principle. Here's the math of how it actually works. The self-energy embedding phi functional is given by the weak coupling or GF2 or GW phi functional in the entire space to which you add a strong coupling solution in a subspace and then subtract a uh, double counting correction. And if we take this, let me skip this, and we take this and we actually apply it to systems where we have exact solutions, like here, um, hydrogen molecules and hydrogen uh, chains of hydrogens uh, in, uh, as a function of the stretching distance, we can see that as we're adding diagrams, as we make the correlated subspace bigger and bigger and bigger, we can actually become quantitative for uh, the stretching of these molecules, not just in the weak coupling regime, but also as we pull these molecules apart. And pulling these molecules apart, in a way, uh, is a strong coupling, or, or is, corresponds to what the physicists would call uh, increasing your U, or going over a strong correlation, uh, or into a strong correlation um, regime. Now, Dynamical mean field theory, as I've told you, is an approximate formulation. There's a different way of making it exact or, or pushing it towards a, uh, an exact solution, exact solution, and that is by increasing the size of the impurity that you're looking at. Here, I have it in a formulation, the so-called dynamical cluster approximation, where we write the self-energy. We multipole expand it with basis functions. Those basis functions have frequency-dependent coefficients. The K dependence is absorbed in that basis function. And then we truncate that multipole expansion at some expansion term. And now we have a systematic small parameter back, namely this NC, or one over this NC. For NC equals to one, you get single side DMFT. As you let NC go to infinity, you recover the exact solution, right? And in practice, you are somewhere in between. You do a sequence of larger and larger systems and try to extrapolate to the thermodynamic limit. Now, in the Hubbard model, in interesting regimes, like in the superconducting regime, we can go all the way to 100 clusters. What we can do is we can qualitatively look at clusters of size four, eight, and 16. Here's a cluster of size eight. And we can look at the different phases that this model spontaneously exhibits. Uh, for example, here you see as a function of interaction and as a function of doping that the model is Fermi liquid-like all the way over here at a large doping and at weak interaction. As we take it and we increase the interaction or we reduce dopants, we end up in a D-wave superconducting regime. And as we further uh, increase the interaction or reduce uh, dopants, we end up in a pseudogap regime and at half filling there's a mod state. So this is now very interesting because if you go over here at an interaction that is similar to the bandwidth, you are qualitatively in a regime that looks similar to what you find in the cuprates. And we can indeed start down here and just look at the superconducting order parameter. We'll see it come up 
gradually detach from half filling and then build a superconducting dome that here gradually becomes smaller and then eventually will uh, disappear. With that, we can do all sorts of interesting things. We can, for example, compute susceptibilities, so not just single particle Green's functions, but two particle Green's functions. From the two particle Green's functions, we can obtain generalized susceptibilities. These are functions of three momenta, three K points. And from those susceptibilities, we can uh, obtain information about superconducting pairing, but also directly make a connection to experiment. For example, look at uh, the magnetic susceptibility and obtain from it the night shift, the relaxation time, or the spin echo decay time as it is measured in nuclear magnetic um, resonance. Uh, another way to look at these things is we can take susceptibilities, and now we can finally uh, extract a vertex function out of these susceptibilities, and then ask the uh, what question that theoretical physicist always want us to answer. What is it that causes superconductivity? What is it that causes a pseudogap? Here's a, an extract from a calculation from a pseudogap. Um, what you see here is a result for the self-energy. Here's the imaginary part of the self-energy uh, as a function of frequency at pi zero and at pi half pi half. What you see here qualitatively is that this has an upturn at pi half pi half indicating metallic behavior, whereas at pi zero you find a downturn indicating mod insulating or insulating uh, behavior. So with that, you have a good metal at the node and a bad metal at the antinode. Now, from the vertex function that we get from the susceptibilities, we can, via the equation of motion, we can uh, get back the self-energy. And there are various ways that you can decompose that vertex function. For example, we can decompose it as spin fluctuations, as charge fluctuations, and as particle-particle fluctuations. And we can just simply ask, if we decompose this as spin fluctuations, is there a dominant signal? Is there a, what physicists call a dominant channel that uh, shows a signal? Um, or if we decompose it in charge fluctuation, is there a dominant uh, signal? Or if we look at superconducting or particle-particle fluctuations here, do we find, for example, that D-wave superconducting fluctuations are prominent in uh, this uh, pseudogap phase? What you see here, is the result of that decomposition, so the decomposition is exact, you get the exact self-energy back. Um, if we decompose this into charge, you see a more or less flat signal over here, same with particle-particle. If we decompose it into spin fluctuations, you can see that in that pseudogap picture that causes this self-energy over here, about 90% or so of that signal are caused by short-range spin fluctuations here. You see the pi-pi antiferromagnetic uh, spin fluctuations. And that now gives us a way of looking at these fluctuations and telling you not just that, yeah, we have a result that shows pseudogap, but also um, the dominant contribution to that pseudogap result comes from, well, antiferromagnetic short wavelength uh, fluctuations. Uh, with the susceptibilities, here's a different way of looking at them, right? We can always ask, how likely is that system to undergo superconducti a superconducting phase transition? And we can do that not just uh, at low temperature where we actually make that system go superconducting, but we can just be at fairly high temperature and simply scan parameter space and ask, as we scan the parameter space, how likely is that system to undergo a transition? Here you find a heat map or a color plot of uh, the system. This is interaction, this is doping, and the red here is where the system is most likely to undergo a phase transition. What you find is, that if you have an interaction that is, in this case, about two-thirds or so of the bandwidth, and you go away from half-filling, the Hubbard model in two dimension wants to become superconducting. As we change the doping, you can see there's this banana that develops and then moves the maximum out here uh, to this uh, doping. Here's a third uh, answer. This is now a direct comparison of susceptibilities to what we find or what we measure in experiments. What you find here is the NMR night shift as a function of temperature. In a Fermi liquid, you would expect that NMR night shift to be pretty much boring and just sort of not do anything at all, maybe flat, be flat, until you hit the superconducting transition temperature, at which point the NMR night shift should just simply plummet towards zero. And that is exactly what we find in the overdope regime, which for these parameters is somewhere over here, right? There's not that much happening to that night shift until you hit DC. At TC, the night shift is strongly suppressed and plummets towards zero. 
Now, the interesting uh, thing is to ask what happens if we go to a pseudogap phase? I've already shown you that D-wave superconducting fluctuations are pretty much absent in this uh, calculation. Now, if you look at these results here, you see that the NMR night shift uh, goes over a maximum. That maximum is the onset of the pseudogap uh, phase. As we push it farther along, you can see that the NMR night shift is suppressed. That suppression, as I showed you, has nothing to do with superconducting fluctuation until it goes through TC. And as it goes through TC here, you can also see it in green. There's really not that much change that you observe in uh, the night shift. So theorists have uh, speculated that the suppression of the night shift signifies the onset of D-wave superconducting fluctuations and shows you that preformed pairs are already present somewhere over here. And one of the ways that we can now use this formalism to look at these calculations is really we can compute those fluctuations, attribute them to, in this case, short range anti-ferromagnetic fluctuations, and show that up here they have nothing to do with the suppression of the night shift. It is only over here in the superconducting phase that that uh, happens. Um, with this, I'm out of time. I hope I could give you a little bit of an overview here of how we're trying to do diagrammatics. Uh, you know, take the 1950s formalism of Feynman diagrams, throw it on a computer, make it do stuff, then take the analytic toolkit that people have developed in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, throw that one onto a computer, use it as a starting point so that we just have to do the rest, and then use that toolkit to try and say something about interesting systems. For example, systems out of equilibrium here for this uh, voltage splitting of the condo peak, superconducting system, or really try to answer a you know, why question the way that theoretical physics likes to uh, pose them to us. Thank you for your attention.